Coming your way on Art Rocks, a photographic project reveals how the Mississippi River has shaped and been shaped by the industry drawn to its shores. This project is about conflict, which is manifested through visual juxtaposition. Colorful brushstrokes. The nature is a real master. They make a beautiful composition, the beautiful color is. So you can learn a lot of stuff from the nature. A timeless singing sensation. And how to turn a house into a creative space for working architects. All that up next on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine and your host for another episode of Art Rocks. Human endeavor has always drawn us to waterways as we seek to harness the river's potential for transportation, irrigation and industry. Today, some of the largest and most complex industrial projects in the world have taken shape along the course of the Lower Mississippi River. For almost 20 years, photographer Richard Sexton has been chronicling the industrial landscape of the Lower Mississippi and drawing stark contrasts between land use, past and present, along America's arterial waterway. Sexton's latest book, the book Enigmatic Stream, documents his findings. Enigmatic Stream is a project that I started in the early 2000s. I just finished a book for Chronicle in San Francisco on the river road between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, but I was focusing on the historic sites, the plantation architecture. I saw the heavy industry that has come in over the last uh, century or so and sort of supplanted cane farming along this corridor. So I started photographing it, then in 2014 I returned to it seriously and most of the photographs in the exhibit and in the book were taken in 2014, 15, and 16. All of this stuff was very mysterious to me and that it was a main impetus for the title, Enigmatic Stream, was my metaphor for this section of the river from Baton Rouge to New Orleans. And I was just intrigued by it. And there's also a lot of controversy around the heavy industry. The entire project is shot in black and white. And I did that for a couple of reasons. The major reason is I felt it was more flattering to the subject matter. And that's the entirety of the subject matter. This project is about conflict, which is manifested through visual juxtaposition. So you're seeing heavy industry, but you're also seeing the context of nature around it. And I felt everything from the muddy river to the oil refineries to the alumina plants, it looked better in black and white. Also, at twilight and at night, when everything is lit up, the superfluous stuff sort of melts into the background, only the things that are lit. And the plants operate 24-7, they're going all the time. And so at night, they look like, um, in fact, I described them in my forward as uh, they glowed like Orwellian metropolises in the void of the rural night. I wanted to explore it. I thought it was very interesting visually. We all rely on it. The heavy industry is here for a reason, and they're producing products that we use every day. And it's also more varied. When people see it, the first thing they think of, oh, it's all refineries and petrochemical plants. But it is so much more than that. It's aluminum plants. And it's sugar refineries that go all the way back to the original land use along the river from when the Europeans first arrived. The strongest and most important images to the photo essay are those that portray very dramatically this juxtaposition, this, this irony or a contradiction between land use, where you have a ranch house next to a power plant, or you have a suburban house 
that's right at what they say is at the fence line. In other words, the backyard of the house abuts a chain link fence behind which you have a refinery or some industrial thing. And that's not common. That's generally, you don't see that. Uh, that's what zoning and planning are all about. You separate incompatible uses. This is one of my favorite pictures. It is taken at Taft, Louisiana, a town that no longer exists. It's one of the most abrupt juxtapositions. Holy Rosary Cemetery is surrounded by the Taft Carbide Chemical Plant. The chemical plant occupies the site where Taft used to be. Even the, the church has been moved. The only thing that's left of Taft is the cemetery. And everybody that goes up and down the river road here, they always stop to take a picture here because this is a setting that isn't lost on anybody. Another f photograph that's an important one to me is this one. I'm at the Bonnie Carey Spillway. Here's the spillway. The Batcher is flooded. It's in the spring. And in the distance, in the background, is Norco. And up in the air, there's a plane landing at uh, New Orleans Airport. And although there's no jet fuel produced at Norco that I'm aware of, here, this is mostly gasoline, but it is emblematic of the sort of infrastructure that makes this possible. But this is a connection that we don't ordinarily make. We take air travel for granted, and we really don't think that much about where the jet fuel comes from. And in many cases, these plants are historical. Norco, for instance, which is an acronym for New Orleans Refining Company, that has incorporated into the plan a company town that Shell established in the 1920s. Now, if they had it all to do over again, they would have done it very differently. But nobody realized how this was going to evolve over time, how dangerous it might be, the kind of accidents that might occur, and the sorts of manufacturing processes that would be added over time. So now you have... Um, a company town of about 3,600 people that's right in the middle of a huge complex of heavy industry. So it is controversial. This corridor, I don't refer to it as this, but it's also known by the moniker Cancer Alley because there is strong suspicion and considerable evidence that there is a heightened risk of cancer because of the living in such close proximity to the plants and the discharges from the plants and so forth, as well as accidental contamination that can occur from time to time. That is a part of the discussion. It's not just global warming, it's not just coastal erosion, it's also how safe is life along the river. The river has been heavily commercialized and it's devoted to shipping and industry. The river as this treasured part of the natural environment that we want to look at or even use recreationally. We don't have that because it's too dangerous for one thing to actually swim in the river or canoe in the river or boat in it or do the kinds of things that normally might be done where they're not huge ocean-going ships coming up and down the river all the time. Now, there are places in both Baton Rouge and, and in New Orleans where the river is accessible. There's Crescent Park, there's the fly uptown where people go to walk their dogs. There are walkways along the levee, they have those in Algiers Point, and then there are the views every time you cross the bridges to get from one side to the other. But we're not able to utilize it in the same way that uh, so many other places are. So it's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that the residents that live along the river and in the river parishes that they make to facilitate the commercial exploitation of the river. The river doesn't really behave in its organic form in the way that we would like it to. So we have engineered the river to stay in its course and to not flood 
both of these things are causing environmental problems because the land that we're on was created by the river, the annual spring flooding. But that interfered with commerce. It interfered with human habitation of the landscape along the river. So it was made not to do that. And it was billions of dollars that were spent to make sure that the river didn't flood anymore. And so the very process of commercializing the use of the river has caused the coastal erosion. All the bridges between New Orleans and Baton Rouge are included in this project. And they're all high bridges because ocean-going vessels have to get beneath them. They can't be that high over the river and just terminate immediately on either bank. The approaches to the bridges themselves are a big part of the design, particularly for the Huey P. Long Bridge, which is a railroad bridge in addition to a car bridge. And the train requires a much longer approach and descent than automobiles do and trucks. So it's really quite a fantastic infrastructure, most of which is built over land. The river part of it, the highest part, is just the crest of it. This is the base of the Crescent City Connection, the bridge that connects the East Bank and the West Bank in New Orleans. And this is a part of the bridge that you don't see. It's the base of the bridge. It's only seen by the people that live beneath it. There's a working class neighborhood in Algiers Point that's beneath the bridge here. This book, Enigmatic Stream, is actually my 14th book. So it goes all the way back to the 80s, a lot of commercial projects, but the very first book that I did that would resonate with Louisiana residents would be New Orleans Elegance and Decadence, which was a book I did in the early 90s about New Orleans and the people that lived here really in a postmodern kind of way in a very old city, and they were living in historic buildings in quite interesting ways. Accomplished artists from near and far are showcasing work in communities near you. So here are some of our picks for notable exhibits coming soon to museums and galleries in your neck of the woods. For more about these and many more events in the arts, subscribe to Arts Monthly, the new free e-newsletter from the editors at LPB and Country Roads magazine. Sign up at lpb.org slash artrocks. And while you're there, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program. So to see or share any episode again, visit lpb.org slash artrocks. Bye bye Louisiana, hello Shoreview, Minnesota, which is where you've got to go to see Yudong Shen at work these days. The artist, who was born in China but moved to the US in the 1990s, is a master of traditional Chinese ink painting, a 2,000 year old discipline that he makes his own using richer colors than the traditional form dictates. Take a look at how Shen applies traditional tools and techniques to capturing the landscapes of his adopted home. Asian brush painting is a very old painting, started uh, over 2,000 years ago. Traditional Asian brush painting has uh, three uh, major subjects. Uh, one is figure painting, another one is landscape painting, and uh, uh, flower and bird painting.
I learned a lot from Western painting years ago. I tried to put the scales into Asian bread painting, put more colors, more contrast, even broke some traditional rules, make a painting has modern, kind of like develop my space. So I mixed the Western painting style with the Asian bread painting. I try my best to paint my Asian brush painting more colorful, more peaceful, more color contrast, and a lot of color balance stuff in there, and mix with the ink. So I still uh, mix the water with the paint, but it depends how much water. Some parts of the paint dry, some parts of the paint wet. So make a different layers and mix with the inks. It's the fun part. The chalpa is uh, very important for Asian brush painting. Chalpa has uh, two kinds. One is a uh, red color. Another one is the background is a red color. So there's a different kind. So sometimes we uh, we have uh, um, the name chalpa, uh, like uh, sign name and the name chalpa. And sometimes we have like uh, xian zhang. Xian zhang means like uh, like a very nice word for the painting, you mean something, and then put the xian zhang in somewhere, like a corner or somewhere, make the painting good balance. So yeah, this is a very, very important part for Asian brush painting. Now, a musical legend. Pat Boone's career has spanned over 60 years and took him from the stage to the silver screen. This Nashville transplant to Hollywood recounts some of the standout milestones and memorable moments in his amazing life. Ever together, now and forever. So Shirley and I married at 19 and she was so relieved. She's the daughter of Red Foley, the great country call a Hall of Fame singer, Red Foley. She'd seen enough of show business, singing and the demands it makes on a performer, especially if he's successful. And she didn't want any more of that. She, well, within a couple of years, I'd won a national talent contest, the forerunner of shows like American Idol. It was Ted Mack Amateur Hour, national TV, won three weeks in a row, to my amazement, led to a recording contract with Dot Records. My first record, a million selling hit. I'm mean, now in North Texas State, and we're about to have our first child at, at 20. And all of a sudden, I've got a million selling hit record. The next was Ain't That a Shame. The next, from then on, from, from March of 55 to late February of 56, when Elvis hit with uh, Heartbreak Hotel, in, in that 11 month period, I had six million selling singles, two of them number ones, in 11 months just before Elvis hit with Heartbreak Hotel. So while his career washed away, <laughs> the careers of many others. I, I matched him record for record for five years. All of a sudden, Shirley realized I was never going to be the school teacher and located preacher. But, but we still determined when we moved from New Jersey by then to California that we were going to live by what I call Tennessee standards, the things I had been brought up, believed, um, was convicted and convinced of. And that's the way we raised our daughters four daughters in Hollywood, California. They all married good Christian guys, uh, have given us 16 grandkids, and now those grandkids have given us, so far, nine great-grandkids. 63 years, this surely is my 64th year, in Hollywood. And so these principles by which I have lived, I know they seem square to some people, and they seem outmoded or irrelevant, uh, in particular in Hollywood. On a day like today We pass the time away Writing love letters In the sand When I graduated from college at age 23 in uh, my cap and gown, I was on the cover of TV Guide because my Pat Boone Chevy show was already 
Times number one in the Nielsen's, and I'm 23, and all the major stars were coming on and singing with me. I'd already made several movies. I'd had a number of hit records. I was Elvis's only competition in that time, the last half of the 50s. And I graduate magna cum laude from Columbia uh, in the middle of all of this with four kids. I'm on the cover of TV Guide. You open it up and there's a picture of my wife Shirley and four little girls at 23. And that's the kind of pace that I seem to have lived most of my time. Prospective home buyers often go in search of that elusive quality called character. A house with a history, a place with an identity developed over time. When the principals at Kinley Morrow Architecture set out in search of new headquarters in Houston, Texas, they wanted a place to reflect their conviction that when it comes to good architecture, character matters. They found it in an 1800s former residential building. No surprise that this pair of architects had the vision to make it work. <laughs> That was Michael's idea to, to cut the slot through and um, honestly it was a little nerve wracking for me. I think the main thing for me is once you do this, it's definitely not a house anymore, it's an office. We are in the, the new Kinney Morrow uh, architecture offices in a pretty old house that uh, used to be across the street. House was built in 1880s and was actually on another lot in the neighborhood. So we moved it over here and um, cleaned it up and uh, here we are. The house had only had two owners and so it was fairly pristine. Not, not a lot had been uh, done to it. So we did very little actually uh, to the house. It's pretty much as it was except for uh, we cut this big slot through in order to sort of create continuity between the spaces but still recognize you know what the house was. Not only does it make a strong statement as far as connecting the whole house but literally when people are working here you can you know talk to each other and you can collaborate more closely so it's a great idea. Michael's very good at what he does and sometimes I just have to have faith and um, let him make strong statements. We did take all the windows out, we took the trim off, we stripped all the, the old paint that was on it, we took all the exterior siding off, we insulated from the outside, put it back, painted it again so you have the texture of the wood but it's not so distracting so we just paint it white. So it's all the original texture and the original wood, but it's, it's up to today's standards as far as energy. The older wood is much stronger. It's one of those things that if we were building a house new, we couldn't afford to have wood paneling on every single surface as like you see here. So part of it is that the older materials are better, but part of it is that that's what's available because it's in the house. So there's four places for desks and they were kind of treated the same way that we treated the floors and all the rest of the shelving, so everything stained black. You know, the biggest problems in houses and in offices is storage and having enough room. Architecture has a lot of paper, so, uh, and printers and a lot of books and binders and basically archiving things is really important. So we, we kind of created a hierarchy of things that were open for our library, for instance, versus the things that we can kind of hide away and access easily but that aren't totally necessary for us to see every day. We had a single photograph that had been taken, I think, in the 70s. Great thing about that is the original porch was missing on the house before it was moved. So by this one photograph, we were able to rebuild it as best we could. I think the porch, uh, it's a t typical feature around here, and it's, you know, it also sort of becomes another outdoor room. It's just a key feature to the house and you know, adds a fair amount of square footage to what's a really small house on the interior. We're just getting to the point where we needed more space and we also really feel strongly about this neighborhood so we wanted to make an investment so we thought a good investment that would also be someplace where we could work would be to find an old house and do something like this. 
I've worked in a huge range of different environments, like in towers or in corporate environments. I've worked in principals' homes, in their actual living rooms. It's kind of nice because it's kind of in between, where I feel like I'm in a home, but it's been curated specifically for the work that we do. So I really like working here, and it's, it is really productive. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, you can always find, see, and share episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you want to know more about the culture that surrounds you, Country Roads Magazine makes a case for searching out interesting things in life, art, and adventure all across the state. So until next week, I've been James Fox Smith, and thanks to you for watching. <laughs>